Hello and welcome back to Wargaming with me Gary. Um, what I'm going to do today is it's a historical investigation video. This is what we discussed in the, in the previous video. Uh, and this one is about the early dynastic period. However, before I do that, because you don't want to, I'm sure you don't want to just see me merbling on about um, historic, historical facts and figures. So what I'll do is I'm just going to, let me see if I can get that, just there, and then I'll zoom in. Oh, wrong way. Um, so let's bring that back here. Okay. Now the reason I'm doing this is because whilst I'm chatting away, I can cut out these videos, or, or these uh, transfers from little, little Big Man Studios. So, so like I said, to, today I'm going to talk about the um, early dynastic period. Uh, so, and so really, it's, it's, here I am again, trying to get closer to the period of 2450 BC to, and 2400 BC. Uh, and this, if you remember, is the period, oh, you can't see that, let's just bring that there, okay. Um, so, um, th this is the period when uh, the first king of Assyria was running around uh, to Dia. Yeah, so, so that's the first thing. What I'll do is I'll, I'll cut around that in a bit. But at the moment, I'm just going through every, just picking out the ones I want. I need to pick out six, um, and these are all going to be red, uh, red, white, and blue. Okay, uh, so the early dynastic period uh, is generally dated between 2900 BC and 2350 BC. See, I'm getting closer to the uh, Tudia period. Um, Oh, there's two on here I, I can't look, look of. Three, in fact. So let's just cut them down a little bit. I'll still do that. Okay, all right. So move that out of the way. Um, yeah, so where was I? So uh, I've got some bullet points. So, so if I, if I'll just try and keep me on track. Um, so, um, yeah, so the early dynastic period was preceded by the Uruk uh, period and the Jamdat and Nasser period, um, which saw the formation of the first states and the cities, and so, so the first city state story, and the invention of writing. So I'm mentioning these things because I think some of these things are very interesting and, and informative. Well, interesting, informative. Yeah. Um, so well worth. So it's well worth knowing. I feel. Just cut that down there. Okay. Uh, the early dynastic period is characterised by the existence of multi-city states. This development ultimately led to the unification of uh, much of Mesopotamia under the rule of Saragon of Akkad, uh, the first king of Akkadian Empire, of the Akkadian Empire. However, Saragon did live uh, a little bit before Tudia, so I'm, I'm not going to concentrate too much on that period. Um, so the Sumerian states like Uruk, uh, Uruk, I should say, Ur, Lagash, Uma, and Nipia, uh, located in Lower Mesopotamia, were very powerful and influential to the north and west, and stretched. Um, so sorry, uh, west stretched. S sorry, I've made uh, no to the north and the west. Um, okay. Oh, I see. To the north and to the west stretched the state centered on on cities such as Kish. Mary and uh, Naga and Elba. Let's just cut this down here. Bear with me. Oops. Oh, these scissors aren't the sharpest scissors in the world. Okay. Uh, the third dynastic period uh, between 2600 BC and 2350 BC. Ah, 
Now, forgot to say, <laughs> as is always the way with these things, oh, I'm gonna have to put a pair of glasses on. I need my magnifying glasses. Now, let's just switch that. I I'll still be able to see them. Right, okay. Um, let's, let's go back to that a minute. Okay, right. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, so there's actually three dynastic periods: uh, the first, second, and third. Um, and saw an expansion in the use of writing and increasing social inequality. Now, this is interesting. Now, I'll tell you why it's interesting because it points out that the spike in inequality wasn't due to wealth. The spike in inequality was due to education, because that's what it says about the, the spike was due to um, an increase of uh, reading and writing. So that's, I find that very interesting. Uh, the textual evidence suggests that southern Mesopotamia was primarily occupied by Sumerians who spoke Sumerian, a single isolate language, or a single, single language isolate. Now, I'm no linguistic expert at all, but what I do know is, for example, uh, the West, so us and Europe, are very much, our, our language has been shaped through uh, Latin and Greek, the Latin and Greek language, and other languages which it's come into contact with. Whereas the Sumerian language stood on its own, it wasn't influenced by others, as far as we know, it, it, it developed upon itself. Yeah, interesting. Agriculture in Lower Mesopotamia relied, whoops, sorry. Let's just bring that down a bit. And a bit more. Can we see what I'm doing there? Yeah. Um, yeah. No? Raise. That's better. Okay. Um, yes, agriculture in Lower Mesopotamia relied on intensive irrigation, which included barley and dates. Animal husbandry was also practiced, uh, focusing on sheep and goats. These agricultural systems were probably the most productive in the entire ancient Near East. Now, and we we have actually touched on this before. If you remember, we, we spoke about um, this massive rush to try and acquire as much land as possible. Um, so you would need to be near a water source in order to you, um, set up an irrigation system. So water, very valuable, as, as has always been the way. Um, where were we? The uh, dominant political structure was the city-state, in which a large urban centre dominated the surrounding rural settlements. Uh, the most important uh, centres were Uruk, uh, Yu, Lagash, Abad, Abad, yeah, sorry, um, just checking I pronounced that right, and Uma or Gisha. Um, available texts from this period point to reoccurring conflicts between the neighbouring kingdoms, notably between Uma and Lagash. Both these city-states were Sumerian, so lots and lots of infighting. Going on. Drop your scissors, excuse me. Yeah, so lots and lots of infighting going on. Um, why am I putting this one by? Okay. There doesn't seem to be one on there with red, white, and blue. Or on there. So let's just quickly count these up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's plenty. So I've got one similar to this, so I will cut this around. In actual fact, I won't cut it around just yet. I'll, I'll wait until I get to a point where I can put my magnifying glasses on. Um, so uh, available text from this period, uh, points reoccurring, um, conflicts, yes, so we've done that. In the north, uh, Kish possibly was competing with other powerful political en entities such as Mary and Ash Akshak. Akshak. I'm going to have to look that up. Hey, oh, Akshak, that was mentioned before in a previous video about um, an unknown area. So, um, yeah, because, because that was the one which conflicts against Tudia because 
they know that Lagash had a trade agreement of some sort um, and initially we thought it was with Tudia when you know when we read um, but this Ak Akshak um, they actually now believe it was with with them and not with Tudia which actually throws some um, mystery or doubt on um, on the existence of Tudia so Oh, well, just have to see how that works out. I'm, I'm, hopefully, someone's going to unravel something about this in the future, and uh, they'll be able to say. Um, I wonder if you can see that. If I zoom in just a little bit, then I can show you the ones I've picked out. Yeah, yeah. So I've picked that one out there. So I think that's quite a nice one. Um, yeah. So in uh, Jebel Hamrin fortresses. Uh, like Tel Guba and Tel Madur, uh, it has been suggested that these sites were established to protect the main trade route from Mesopotamia lowlands and the Iranian plateau. See now, that that's that that could be very useful for one of the um, campaigns I do, you know, where um, Tudia could be um, told that he has to troops to protect this area or something like that. Anyway. In the middle uh, third millennium, El Elam uh, emerged as a powerful political entity in entity, sorry, in the area of southern Luristan and northern Kaz Kazakhstan. Uh, Susa was a central place in Elam and an important gateway between southwestern Iran and south so, and southern Mesopotamia. Just that's an, I think that's another nice one. I've got a similar one like that already, so that will that will um, gel in just like nicely. Each city state was centered on a temple which was dedicated. Can you see that? Sorry, I'll move that out. Yeah, uh, dedicated to its patron deity and ruled over by either a king, which would like they refer to a, a legal, legal, or a priestly governor, an NC. Um, kingship was seen as um, sorry. So the kingship was handed down by the di di deities, and could be transferred from one city state to another. Another one. Now this is a new. This is from the Semite uh, range, and I think this is very nice. Where are we? Um, yeah, a legal during this time has been assumed to have been normally a young man of outstanding qualities from a rich landowner family. Okay, a renowned scholar, uh, Thorklid, Thorklid Jacobson, theorised that a legal was originally an elected war leader. I keep putting that off there, sorry, I do apologise. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a nice one there. Um, when were we war leader? The functions of such a legal, so that's a king, would in, include military defence against enemies, arbitration in border disputes, along with certain ceremonial and cultic activities. Once the legal died, once the king died, the eldest son of the legal would become the successor. The NC, um, Yura Kajina, of the city state of Lagash is best known for his reforms to combat corruption. The code of the Yura Kajina is sometimes cited as the earliest known example of a legal code in recorded history. Ah, now I, I must admit, I like this sort of stuff because it, it, it kind of ties things and pulls things together. Um, you've seen that one. And then the last two, so I've, there, there's seven here I've picked. Oops, there we are, seven I've picked there. Uh, so I'm going to pick out the six that I like best. Although I've, I've got um, another six figures for them to go on. So I'll be putting them on these shields. Let me just show you these shields whilst we're there. Yeah. So I'm jumping around a little bit, but oh, that's okay. Because primarily I, I want this to be about wargaming. Um, but but I think this is quite interesting because it, it like when we get to doing battle reports and such... It will show you where we're at. And also, what I'm also going to do is, whilst we're here, I'm going to quickly go through. These are some of the ancient Egyptians that I'm working on. So I, I think I'll I'll show you some of these. If I can just get that in the right position now, 
and now I'll just spin that round. So he's, he's on the way to being done, so we'll keep going in a minute. So, right, so the code of Urakajina limited the power of both the priesthood and the large property owners, took measures against burdensome controls, hunger, theft, murder, and, and seizure of people's property and persons. Uh, the Urakajina stated, as Urakajina stated, the widow and the orphan were no longer at the mercy of the powerful man. Well, blimey, crikey, I, I, I think we seem to be going backwards because that's, that's, I mean, that's amazing. I say we're going backwards, not really, I'm only kidding. But, but it is, I mean, really interesting to know that there was some kind of ethical, like, some kind of ethical thoughts that was going on about the rights of the like the, the lower classes as well as the rich and powerful um, and educated not remembering that um, we've already established that um, um, education um, caused a spike in in um, the poorer people being um, losing more, more control um, so yeah uh, during the third uh, early dynastic period, uh, Ur was um, importing elite goods from geographically distant places. These objects included precious metals such as gold and silver and semi-precious stones. Mesopotamia was very well situated for the agricultural production of plants and animals. However, it was lacking in natural resources such as metals, minerals and stones. Mm. The text from Shur Yupak, uh, dating to the third dynastic period, also seemed to confirm the existence of a Ki Anga League. A Ki, sorry, I'll, I'll try to pronounce that again. Ki Ingia. Ki, oh, right, so it's a Ki Ingia League, um, which was member city states of an alliance, including Uma, Lagash, Uruk, or Uruk. Uh, Nippur and Adab. This alliance seems to have focused. That's not, I, I like this one. It looks really nice. Um, let's get this one out. Um, so these are all like this, slightly different, and I'll, um, I will be finishing those as soon as possible. This alliance seems to have focused on economic and military collaboration, as each city would dispatch dispatch soldiers to the league. The Primacy of Kish is illustrated in, by the fact that its ruler, Mesilim, Mes 2050 BC, acted as arbitrator in a conflict between Lagash and Uma. So we're, we're getting back to that Lagash and Uma. But all to do with, like, mostly to be doing with Suma and the Sumerian, Sumerian states, because these are all the same, that they're all from Sumeria. Um, so um, where are we? Yeah, whether Kish held this, right, okay, so Uma. However, it is not certain whether Kish held this elevated position during the entire period, as the situation seems to have been different during later conflicts between Lagash and Uma. Uma. An ancient, well, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, I've, I've just made a bullet point there because this, what's it again? The key. Where is it? Ki Enga, Enga, the Ki Engia. Ah, the Ki, Ki Engia is almost like an ancient UN. Uh, and this fellow, Misalim, appears to be a regular Henry Kissinger. So, yeah, so ha, um, it just goes to show how, how far forward these people were thinking. I mean, I know, necessity creates. It does. Necessity uh, creates progress because they needed to like, uh, build alliances and this is clearly where it went but but it's not dissimilar to what the sort of things which have you know been going on in, even in the 20 21st century later rulers from other cities would use the title king of kish to strengthen their ambitions it is only for the later period of the early dynastic period that information on political events becomes available either as echoes in later writings or from contemporary sources. Writings from the end of the third millennium include several Sumerian heroic na narratives 
and the Sumerian king list. Um, well, I mentioned this before in the previous video, in a previous video, seem to echo events and military conflicts that may have occurred during the second the early dynastic period. For example, the reigns of legendary figures like uh, King Gilgamesh of Uruk and his adversaries um, like from Kish, uh, possibly dated to the second early dynastic period. The epic of Gilgamesh and his mate en Enkidu, um, and then I've got to say here, yeah, like, um, brilliant, brilliant, I've, I've read this. Uh, Doug C uh, sent me a link, and Doug, I've got to say thank you very much. I, I found it really, really interesting, and it also led me on to other sources which I, which I will be using, and, and notably, um, it helped me pronounce Uruk, um, as opposed to me saying Uruk. Um, so yeah, so, so because they, cause it's mentioned a lot in there, um, and it also pointed at the Sumerian Empire or the Sumerian period. So, um, so that's that, that's going to link, lead me on to my next historical investigation. Being a massive fan, right? So now, being a massive fan of uh, Twenty Eight Hours Later, uh, World War Z, and lots of other uh, movies of this genera, gen, genre, uh, I was excited to hear in the um, in the epic. Um, tale of Gilgamesh, the mention that one of the gods threatened to scream so loud that it would raise the dead who would eat the living. Yes, zombies, zombies. I'm um, yeah. How interesting is that? I don't know if this is the earliest mention of zombies, but how how cool is that? Certainly something I'm going to be getting into. Um, I'm, I've got um, what's that zombie side? Um, which I want to paint up all the figures and start playing. But that, um, I'm, I'm going to start up a little um, zombie historical fact line. Um, so these, right, so that's them figures uh, shown you there. I've shown you the, um, shown you the, uh, that, um, some of the transfers I'm working on. I want to just quickly show you here. These, I, I, I've got a um, Athenian army, which yeah, I ain't painted, even, ain't, not even prepared yet. But I just thought that that might be quite nice for you. These, I could, I could use some of these in there, um, which I will do. Um, I think these are, oh, they're Greek hoplite shields. Oh yeah, so perfect. Yeah, and the other one is as well. So that, they'll, they'll be perfect for that. Um, where was I? Right, so these semi-legendary na narratives, okay, I've done that. Right, no, no, I haven't. So these semi-legendary narratives seem to preserve the memory of an age dominated by two major powers, Uruk and Sumer, uh, in Samir, Sumer, sorry, in Sumer, and Kish in, in the Semitic country. However, the existence of the kings of this uh, heroic age remains controversial. It is only for the third early dynastic period that somewhat reliable contemporary information on political events in Mesopotamia becomes available. These texts come mainly from Lagash, Lagash and detail the reoccurring conflict with Uma about control of irrigated lands, which comes back to what we were discussing earlier. This is another one here, and then these transfers here. I can't wait to get on with the Athenians, actually. Oh, unfortunately, I'm a very slow painter, so, so it's going to take some while. The uh, king of Lagash, uh, the Lagal, uh, are absent from the Sumerian king list, as are the, their rivals, the kings of Uma. This suggests... Can you see them still? Oh, let me raise that. Uh, now, so you can see now the top bits as well. Um, so it suggests that these states, while powerful in their own time, were later forgotten. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, well, I, well, I, I, I say interesting. Well, yeah, of course, but that, that's why it's so difficult to uh, find the information I'm looking for. The royal inscriptions from Lagash also, men sorry, also mention wars against other lower Mesopotamian city-states, as well as against kingdoms further away. Uh, the kings were right. Examples of the latter include Mary, Sabatu, Sabatu and Elam. Uh, now, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I mean, this is going to link in lovely with Tudia and that, that period. 
Um, these conflicts show that all, already in this stage in history there was a trend towards stronger states dominating larger territories. Um, so for example, example King Ientium King Ientium of Lagash was able to defeat Mary and Elam around 2450 BC. Perfect, spot on, exactly the periods we're looking for. Now this looks like, like yeah, so, so, so that is what I'm looking for, and it's going to really help me when I start doing my Tudia um, campaigns. Now, here's a, like this, this one here, which I found out, and this is for my Athenians, when I eventually get round to them, which could like be never the way I'm going, but apparently the Athenians used this type of shield, you know, like the, the wild man shield, um, wild man face on their shield, a lot. So, so that could become in really, really useful. Uh, look at some more here. Now, so we're just slowly going through these whilst I, I go through the um, uh, historical investigation. So uh, this guy, Enshak Yushana of Uruk, Uruk, Uruk uh, seized Kish and imprisoned its king, M.B. Ishta, around 2430 BC. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Lagao, uh, son of Lagao, the king, uh, Zagisai, king of Uruk and Uma, was able to seize most of Lower Mesopotamia around 2400 BC. This phase of war, uh, warring city-states came to an end with the emergence of the Akkadian Empire under the rule of Saragon Akkad. So that's, so, so, Saragon, um, so the emperor of the Akkadian, you know, like, so the emperor of the Akkadian Empire, um, is pretty much as far as I want to go, because that's as far as to the so like he comes into existence really around two two thousand four hundred BC. Well, that's the end of uh, to Dia's reign. Uh, whatever happened to him, um, whether he died, whether he absconded and run away with a beautiful princess, who knows? But that that kind of brings that to the end. So this is the end of my video covering the early dynastic period, which has now led me to look at the history of Sumer, who I believe invented a host of things, not least writing and the will. Hmm. Sounds really interesting. So I'll see you soon. See you next time. I uh, hope this was okay. I know I didn't do much painting, but I think these things are all... Sorry, let me just come up here a minute. Zoom out. Let me just come up here. Zoom out. Yeah. So although it is all still model related, I was showing you the transfers, I've been showing you the Egyptians that I've been working on, showed you the shields that I'm working on, whilst going through my historical investigation. Um, I hope that was okay. Um, quite a lot there. I, I think the next one, if um, the history of Suma brings up a lot of information, I might actually cut it in half so, like, so, to make the videos a little bit shorter. But then that depends because I'm quite getting into other people's longer videos, mainly because I can turn them on and let them run whilst I'm doing my painting or reading or, or whatever. Anyway, I digress. I'm off on a tangent again. So, oh, by the way, do you like my shirt? Harlequins. Yes, new season coming up. Uh, I hope we do better this season. I really do. Okay, so I'll speak to you soon. All the very best and take care. Bye.